Okay, I think we're ready, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's now 1.02 on Friday. And uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, rhinoplasty. Um, getting to be a much more common uh, procedure that I do. Uh, we're probably now doing anywhere from one to two rhinoplasties a week, which is, uh, uh, for all things considered, is a, a very busy rhinoplasty practice. So I'd like to kind of look into um, some of the issues with rhinoplasty and uh, some of the questions that a lot of people have. And if you guys have questions along the way, it's probably a good idea just to write them down. And I have my team here that's kind of looking at them. And at the end, we can kind of just go through them all at, at one time. In the Q and A. Um, so let's go through and try to uh, dispel some of the myths of rhinoplasty, and uh, maybe along the way we can learn a little something. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have uh, people uh, already logged in? How many? Where does this show? Uh, participants. Okay, we have a pretty good group. All right. So let's uh, let's move forward. Okay. So why is rhinoplasty necessary? Well, basic reasons why I see individuals for rhinoplasty really comes down to number one, the social stigma and you know the idea of not having a, uh, in the, at least in our Western culture, um, not having a uh, well appearing nose uh, because it's not a very common thing in our culture. So there's definitely a social stigma um, here in the United States. Uh, the second, uh, and that kind of goes along with aesthetic issues, and I'll, and I'll go into what the normal balance is of the nose and what we're looking for, what are the uh, key features that we want to see with, uh, uh, with a, uh, a well-balanced nose. Um, certainly, we see a lot of functional issues, and those are uh, patients that uh, might not be breathing uh, as well as they like. Um, if they have difficulties with exercise or if they have difficulties with uh, sleeping at nighttime or their spouse says that they uh, snore uh, or sometimes they not only do they snore but they might even stop breathing in the middle of the night and that's uh, something that we call obstructive sleep apnea. So, um, you know, certainly we can improve the function of the nose and allow our patients to breathe much better uh, as a result of this surgery. Um, in fact, when I'm doing um, any nasal surgery, I always address the function of the nose first. And so I wanna make sure that the nose is working well before we ever get it to look good. Uh, so I kind of attribute uh, the analogy of there's no sense in having a Ferrari on the front yard with an engine taken out of it. Uh, it uh, looks great, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we always want to make sure that the nose um, uh, works well. Um, definitely, we see a lot of um, post-traumatic uh, changes that occur to the nose from either trauma uh, or having fallen uh, when you were younger, or you know, a lot of uh, a lot of individuals will have had some kind of an injury playing sports when they were younger, and they might now be noticing uh, worsening breathing and worsening appearance to the nose. And then of course, uh, I see quite a few revision nasal surgeries. Uh, being a specialist, I'm uh, kind of a magnet for these types of uh, procedures because it's a, nasal surgery is a very challenging surgery, uh, and it's one that uh, I believe uh, should be done by uh, specialists of the face and uh, specialists of the nose in the face. So it's a very difficult surgery um, and it's, uh, I, uh, that's the reason I like it so much. So um, those are the main reasons that we'll, we'll be seeing uh, patients for rhinoplasty. Some basic facts about the nose that I want everybody to understand. The nose is an organ. It is not intended to be pretty. I say that again, it is not intended to be pretty. The nose is an, the reason individuals notice a malappearing nose is because it does not fit with the rest of the face. When you have a nose that balances with the rest of the face, you no longer notice the nose. You notice other features of the face, such as the eyes, such as the lips, such as cheekbones, but you never really comment on how, wow, how beautiful your nose is. 
when you have a nose that takes attention away from those other features that are the attractants of the human face, um, that uh, requires some intervention on our part. So like I said, the uh, noses that are not balanced with the face, I attribute to the kid in the back of church who's screaming and crying, right? Everybody in church notices the kid who's crying, but you never notice the 500 other kids that are behaving properly, right? So, <laughs> um, so I think that uh, understanding that, that if we can get that nose back into balance with the rest of the face, then it really is gonna um, uh, overall improve the look of the face without drawing attention unto itself. So some basic myths about rhinoplasty. Um, number one, uh, I just don't find many patients that complain of pain. Uh, like I said, we do several of these a week and most times, probably 98% of the time, maybe 95 to 98% of the time, patients are uh, taking Tylenol for pain. And so what we do in order to manage the pain, which we've found tremendous success with over the years, is that we'll start our patients taking Tylenol three days before surgery, and then we have them continue for three days after surgery, and that does seem to make a big difference. We still give our patients a pain, a pain medication, uh, but we rarely ever see that they, uh, that they need it. Um, the second myth uh, is that uh, the nose is broken during rhinoplasty, and that is not true. Uh, we do not break the bones. Uh, I can tell you though, uh, back when I was starting my, my residency training back in the 90s, uh, we, the nose was broken. And uh, that was a classic way of doing rhinoplasty back in the day. And unfortunately, that provided a very uh, unpredictable manner to control where the nasal bones were going to line up and heal. So we make uh, little small controlled microscopic uh, little cuts in the bone that allow us to um, uh, shape the bones and move them however we want without having to break. And that ends up with less requirement for packing and obviously less uh, bruising around uh, the eyes. In fact, I can remember back when I was uh, in my training, we used to put packs on people's eyes and wrap their head the first night, uh, along with packing in the nose. So the patients after surgery were in pain because of the packing in the nose, couldn't see anything, and then couldn't breathe any, couldn't breathe. So they were absolutely miserable. Now we changed that, and we now, um, we don't use any packing. Um, and obviously um, the bruising is much more minimal, and the patients are breathing the next day. Um, the recovery, much shorter than what it used to be. Uh, most of my patients are working, uh, the splints typically come off, the external splints come off at one week, uh, and our patients are working within, uh, within a day or two of the splints being removed. So we do like to get our patients back to normal and back to normal life as soon as possible. The last one is the plastic look. Now getting back to what we were talking about before, when the nose doesn't fit the face, it's either too big, i.e. unoperated, or it's plastic. And so I showed, um, I showed pictures of, of arguably my favorite singer, Michael Jackson, and when he was young and he was uh, before the Off the Wall album, he had uh, a much larger nose prior to his first rhinoplasty. And then after his first surgery, you can see the difference that it had made. So it really did refine his nose. Now I then move forward to his, uh, his Thriller days, uh, which was, when was Thriller? 82, 83? It was early 80s. It was early 80s. And you can see how he's a, he's a very uh, good looking man, but you know, he had probably what we would now diagnose as uh, body dysmorphia. And so he had multiple surgeries on his nose. And again, this is where revision surgery is a challenge and it's important to find the surgeon that does specialize in this and, and sees a lot of them because he eventually ended up losing a tremendous amount of collagen, I'm sorry, a, a tremendous amount of cartilage in the tip of his nose, rendering it almost uh, useless. And, and, and now attention was taken away from the better features that he had. He had a beautiful smile, he's a good looking guy, to now the attention was taken to 
his nose, which had been overly operated upon. So we want to try to avoid those at all costs. So what is the recovery like? I, I generally have patients breathing the next day after surgery. And I, and I say that I don't have them breathing the day of surgery because generally I have a drip pad that they're wearing that first night. So after that, they take it off the next morning and then most patients start breathing the next day and we start caring for it with uh, uh, saline sprays in the nose to keep everything nice and moist and uh, some Vaseline um, application to the inside of the nose that keeps the nose moist. And remember, a moist nose heals much faster than a dry nose. When we talk about the nose being an organ, you have to consider that the function of the nose, the reason that God gave us this nose is purely to breathe. And what the nose does, it's, 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 it gets air that's dry and say cold, and it warms and humidifies it. And as we take it, we get it back to our throat, we find that that air is now suitable for us to inhale into our lungs. So um, it is a, a, a very uh, effective organ at uh, utilizing air and controlling it in terms of cleaning out um, uh, pollutants out of the air. Uh, and you know, the, uh, if, you, if you consider what happens with rhinoplasty surgery, the first thing that the nose does is it gets somewhat lazy afterwards. And so when you, when you finish the, when you, when the nose is in the recovery phase, it stops humidifying itself and it gets kind of dry. And so we always want to make sure that the nose is staying very moist. I walk my patients very, um, you know, I walk, I walk them very closely through this whole process. So our patients heal quickly because we are getting them back to normal life as quickly as possible. Uh, I generally remove splints within a week. And I have my patients back to work right around them or back to school, um, uh, usually around a week. So who are the candidates? Uh, first and foremost, uh, individuals who have functional issues, uh, individuals with breathing issues. Um, certainly uh, the main reason I see them as a, as a, a plastic surgeon in the face uh, is mostly for aesthetic reasons and they happen to have breathing issues as well. The other issue is a lot, the, the other, uh, um, another thing I want to tell you is that many times when we're addressing the aesthetic purpose of the nose, pa patients don't even know that they have a deviated septum. They always thought that that was normal for them to have some type of obstruction in their nose. Um, and now, and there, and there is, not to get too uh, scientific, but there is something that we call the nasal cycle where the nose fluctuates from left to right about every four to six hours in the adult. And it's about every two to three hours in, in, in the younger, in the child. And so what ends up happening during this nasal cycle is that one side of the nose will swell up as it's cleaning out all those pollutants while the other side of the nose shrinks. Now the side of the nose that's shrunken will breathe much better for that time period. And then after about four to six hours, it flip flops and then the other side opens up. And so you can imagine if you have one side of your nose, it's always deviated. When it's that side's uh, turn to breathe, you now are obstructed completely on both sides of the nose. So that's something that I'll assess during our consultation. And if I see that it's something that we need to fix at the same time, we certainly will. Um, obviously, uh, I see patients for any kind of disfigurement from prior trauma or any kind of revision uh, with obvious malappearance after the surgery, after the original surgery. So in my consultation, I usually spend about an hour with a patient. To all, all, all told, my, cons my, uh, my consultant, patient coordinator will come and sit with you. She will take some photographs of you. She'll take um, not only conventional standard facial uh, photographs, but she'll also take what we call vector analysis pictures, which creates a three-dimensional mapping of the face. And it really helps uh, both the patient and myself uh, only because we can shape the nose together. So I actually go through a virtual rhinoplasty with the patient and I show them, okay, listen, this is where you're starting here on the left. Okay, let's take down this hump. Let's bring this tip back in. Let's balance and harmonize the, the lip uh, tip relationship. And then we can begin to get an idea as to what the profile might look like after the surgery. And so that helps me out. Um, not well, it helps the patient out because now they take home a printed copy of the future of the nose 
and allows them to kind of look over it over the ensuing weeks to months before their surgery. But also on the day of surgery, it helps me out because I'm able to actually see a map of what I want to do and where I want to go with that particular nose. So I'd like to, um, and then after we've gone through the consultation, I explain everything in, uh, in a lot of details that what I think we should do. I, we come to an agreement, the patient and I, and then we plan for a particular uh, surgery. Now, some basic things that I like to see, I like to see balance to the nose. So this is a classic example here of a large hump that was basically taken away and giving this individual the appearance of a very small chin and a very weak cheek. And so by reducing the hump and lifting the tip, we're able to give her a little bit better balance to her profile. And I'm gonna go through some before and afters uh, as we go and, and just show you different types of noses. And again, here's a tip of the nose where you can see that there's a bone right here called the nasal spine that's pushing the whole tip out and it's shortening the lip. And so you see that when we bring that spine back and we balance the lip with the tip of the nose, we see a better line between the lip and the nose. On top of that, of course, we took down some of this hump. We did give ourselves a little bit of a lift and refinement of the tip of the nose, and she's uh, very happy. This was a rhinoplasty from uh, many years ago. Um, another example of a person who's got a large hump, both uh, the hump can be, and most times is two parts. Uh, we'll see the upper part as being bone, and the lower part is being cartilage. At the same time, she had what we call a hanging columella, which means that this lower part of the nose right here hangs down and what it ends up doing is it lengthens the nose and, and, and again, pulls the mid face downward. And so we wanna give a more refreshed mid face, a more uplifted, attention seeking mid face. And um, uh, this is one of, our, uh, our, one of our employees that many years ago, I did fat grafting to her cheeks and she just wanted refinement in the bridge of her nose, and she wanted a little bit of, a, of, of definition here, what we call the super tip, so we were able to achieve that by bringing down the bridge and seeing the tip. If you guys do come here, she's, my, uh, she's one of my nurses, so you'll get to see uh, a real life uh, result after many years of what a rhinoplasty would look like. Um, again, um, this uh, patient, uh, and I have her uh, front and side views, but she had what we call an amorphous nose, a beautiful girl, but she uh, really did not like how her nose didn't have any definition or any uh, lines to it. And so when you look at what you want to achieve after the rhinoplasty, you want to see the nose has a nice slender look. The bones are nice and slender in this area, and then they kind of fade out into what we call a lazy C. You see how it kind of falls out. And then you wanna have now the definition here in this area of the nose. And that's what we call a gall wing shape. And so if you think about the horizon, when you see several birds flying in the horizon, you see that gall wing shape, okay? That's what we're kind of after for that frontal view of the tip of the nose. And of course you can see the refinement that we're able to achieve there. And on profile, you can see the difference. She had what we call a hanging lobule. She had, uh, she had derotation, which means the tip is dropped down or inferior rotation. Um, she definitely had a lack of projection. So her nose was like just kind of that amorphous, didn't really have much character to it. But then afterwards you could see the difference and how much more character we're able to bring back to her nose. And if you go back a picture, you might notice one thing. Here all of a sudden you know you might notice this nose more, but in this picture you notice the eyes more. You see what I'm talking about? So you bring that attention back to the pretty features of the face, which is what we want. All right, here's another example um, that uh, had, you know, again, a very short, what you would think a very short lower face. Uh, once you refine that bridge and once you elevate that tip a little bit, you do see that there's a better balance now between the mid face and the lower face. And here, what's interesting here with this patient, and you may not be able to appreciate as much in this side view, but you'll see in this before picture, the mid face from the lip, or rather from the, from the base of the nose to the brow, looks so much longer than what it does afterwards. And so the mid face looks much shorter and much more balanced when you rotate that lip, I'm sorry, when you rotate the tip of the nose up and the bridge of the nose. And so again, another example from the other side, and you'll see somebody who classically you would have said, wow, she really has a small chin. Well, guess what? 
many times when you have an overly projected tip like she does here, and it's really moving out, the angle between the forehead and the, and the tip back down to the chin is thrown off. Whereas if you just come and you balance the tip of the nose and you bring it back into the face, you will then see how much it settles in and how much the chin actually begins to look a little bit stronger. Okay, so the oblique view, uh, which is kind of that kind of cocked view to one side uh, between a full lateral and a middle, um, you can see here how she doesn't have much uh, of definition to the tip of her nose. Uh, you can't appreciate much on the bridge, but when you come here to the side view, you can then see how by removing this and lifting the tip of the nose, how much uh, uh, refreshed and natural she looks, and you now see her eyes, and you, she just looks more awake and more alive. I mean, look at the difference here. And between the upper third of the face, you, you see a change in the eyes, and that's what I really love about this surgery. And then again, on um, one of our probably more significant changes, this young girl had been, uh, she had been teased. Um, beautiful girl, unbelievable personality. Uh, really, really, really smart. Um, wants to be a veterinarian, I think, or veterinarian or a doctor, one of those two. And she just, uh, you can see on the before picture to the after, how much more mature she looks now, her hair is down in the after picture, but just look how much better balanced her face is, right? Now the nose doesn't jump out, you see her eyes, she's got these beautiful green eyes. Before, you really were perseverating on the tip of the nose and the drawdown of the tip of the nose, right? Well, when you look at your profile, you, I have these flipped, I'm sorry, but you can see in the before picture how much that nose was just taking away from her mid face. And then when you, you, you know, you operate on it, it balances it out and you see a, a much better change. This is only at two months. And again, another example of that amorphous frontal view, um, you know, it just kind of looks like it comes down and just stops. Here, you want to see that nice drawdown and then fade into the tip of the nose. And, you know, you want to see that nice gull wing shape here. And you can actually even see how the lip is better balanced. The relationship between the tip of the nose and the lip is improved as a result of this. And so on side view, you can then see a big difference here. And again, you know, look at the relationship with the chin, big nose, prominent uh, tip, overly projecting tip, um, weakens the chin. You bring the, you bring the tip back, you rotate it a little bit, the chin falls into a better aesthetic balance. And a man um, uh, came from Cuba. Again, I have these before and afters reversed, I'm sorry. Um, but this is his before picture here. You can see kind of that amorphous tip. Afterwards, we kind of uh, helped them out a little bit with the refinement. You gotta be careful with men. I don't like to lift noses too much with men because it just doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. Um, but you, um, you see on profile how he had a big uh, tip of the nose. He had absolutely no ability to breathe either. And so we were able to improve his breathing significantly by uh, obviously taking down the bridge, lifting the tip and straightening out the inside of the nose. Uh, here's that young girl that we saw in the original picture in the vector analysis, right? So frontal view, yeah, some, some changes, right? You might see she's a little crooked here. The tip of the nose is a little bit off. So we were able to bring it back into a straighter balance. But on profile, you can see how we were able to give her that nice profile from here and very close to that picture that we had on the vector analysis, which allows us on, on the day of surgery to really get close in on what result we're after. So that I think is one of the big differences that we're able to provide for our patients undergoing this surgery. Now, what do I think are some important things of selecting um, the right surgeon? Um, obviously you can gather from our talk today that I take a very personalized approach to each one of my patients. I spend as much time possible with you during the consultation. And again, I spend as much time with you on the day of the surgery afterwards. You only see me when you come into this office. Um, I'm the one who's taking off your splint at a week only because I want to know that I am responsible for everything. And I, um, this is a procedure that I take very near and dear to me 
So you are very, very close to me. Uh, I think that experience um, goes along with um, patient satisfaction. And you might find that um, those two things indicate that patients not only are, are happy with their surgery, but they're happy with the office. And uh, we really pride ourselves with our before and afters and our reviews, um, especially uh, when it comes to our reviews, when we see uh, comments about our office and our staff. And I, I think we have the best staff, and we have the uh, uh, best office only because we stay so close to our patients. Um, you're only a cell phone call away from me or my PA uh, at any time, 24 seven. So we're always here for our patients. Uh, the other thing that I think is important in choosing the right facial plastic surgeon is uh, how much ongoing training are they having? And, you know, I, I try, I really push myself in terms of ongoing training. I'm always reading and I'm always trying to improve our surgeries. I, I, get, um, uh, I get offered to lecture at our international and national meetings uh, almost annually. Uh, this year in September, I'll be lecturing in Boston, uh, giving three talks. So I do try to uh, stay up to speed with everything. Um, and of course, I think uh, the most important thing that you're gonna find with a nasal surgeon is do they specialize? Um, is this all they do? If you have an individual that does a rhinoplasty once a month or a person that mostly does breast surgery or body surgery or, um, or some other uh, non-facial surgery, you might, you, you know, you might wanna consider meeting with individuals that just focus on this. Uh, on the right is a copy of my most recent book, uh, The Art of uh, Facial Aesthetics. It's our sixth book. We're currently writing our seventh one. Um, and so we have several changes that we're going to be making in the book. When you come for your consultation, I give you a copy of it. Uh, so you'll, um, you'll be able to get inside of my head a little bit in terms of what my philosophy is in rhinoplasty. Of course, on our website, uh, contora.com, uh, we have a, a, a lot of information on rhinoplasty. We have a lot of educational videos that we've done. Uh, over the years to kind of help uh, reinforce a lot of the things that we just, uh, that I've been uh, talking to you about for the last uh, oh, only 30 minutes. So, yeah, so I think I'm coming to an end. Um, I encourage any questions uh, from patients. Um, and if I, uh, if not, I'm gonna assume that nobody really cares about anything I just said, <laughs> and then we can all go home and have a great weekend. <laughs> I'm kidding, let me see here. Uh, well, we had 16 participants. That's good. Uh, here's somebody. Okay, somebody raised their hand. What does that mean when they raise their hand? Uh, do you want to just type in the question, whoever it is? Um, I can't, can we, can we hear anybody? No, okay. Um, who, uh, whoever just raised their hand, uh, if you have a question, uh, you might want to uh, write it out in the Q&A section and then we can uh, get to it. But I do have a few other, uh, I do have a few questions. Then you have a few for me. Um, regarding um, recovery time, getting back to, I had a student ask me if they want to get those done in the summertime. What's the recovery time? Chad is disabled. Just want to say thank you for this webinar. Yes, yeah, so the only Q&A is working. That's what we said to ask. Oh, okay. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's a common question we get asked all the time is about uh, um, um, uh, recovery. recovery. Usually, uh, we have, you know, we have a lot of uh, kids in between classes and between semesters. So summertime, Christmas, spring break, Thanksgiving break seem to be very popular times to have this done. Uh, but like I said, I mean, this is a type of surgery that within a week you have the splint removed and you're back to work or school. So our, our recovery is pretty quick and you're, pre, and you're breathing pretty uh, darn well through your nose uh, pretty early. So uh, we do like to get our patients uh, uh, back to uh, life pretty early. Um, okay, so let me, uh, how do you have to be to have, a, oh, how old do you have to be to have a rhinoplasty? Generally speaking, um, I like to have patients uh, after their second pubertal spurt. What does that mean? Um, it means that I want the mid face fully. Um, uh, I want the mid face 
fully developed before we do any kind of nasal surgery because I want to see how the nose is gonna fit with that face. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, when, uh, when you come in for a consultation. There is a question here, will skin be peeled apart, separated from nose cartilage during rhinoplasty to reduce middle nose cartilage size? Uh, remember that the idea behind rhinoplasty is shaping bone and cartilage. So depending upon, in order for me to reshape cartilage and bone, you have to separate temporarily the skin from the cartilage and bone in order to shape the cartilage. Then you put everything back together and you're done. I don't make any external incisions unless I absolutely have to. I do everything from the inside. It's a technique called endonasal rhinoplasty. Uh, very few people do that anymore. Uh, because everybody wants to make incisions, open everything up, and that delays your recovery and delays your surgery time. So I try not to do that. Um, but uh, to answer your question, in order to access those nose cartilages, you do have to uh, separate the skin, but you won't even know that it's happened because the skin drapes right back onto the new cartilage and the new bone. And I guess a, a good follow-up question to that is generally, is there gonna be loose skin, say, if you really reduce the nose or the cartilage uh, and there's not because the skin has a tremendous amount of elasticity. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this person's asking me how much do we charge for rhinoplasty? Uh, ballpark is anywhere from seven to ten thousand uh, dollars, depending on how complex the case is. If it's a revision case, uh, usually a little bit more, but if it's a first time, then not. Um, Okay, these before and after photos look great. My biggest fear is getting a cookie cutter nose, LOL. <laughs> it appears the changes you make are perfect for each person. I appreciate that. Um, that's absolutely correct. And that is why it's so important that I sit down with you at consultation and we go through that vector analysis and we both work through the rhinoplasty and we say, okay, it doesn't matter really what I think. Okay, I'm, I'm a surgeon that's trying to give you what you would like you're gonna be the one who looks at this nose for the rest of your life. So it's imperative that you as the patient be comfortable with whatever uh, design of a, a nose or whatever it is that we come up with. And most times I'm able to kind of get inside of a patient's head and I can understand what it is that they want. And so we can, as we work through the rhinoplasty during the vector analysis, I have, you know, I've had sometimes patients says, no, 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 I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to lift here. I just really want to do this. Let's see how that looks. And then, so we work through it together. So I really, what's, a, what's this vector of program has really afforded me the ability to work with my patients on this procedure, which is, I think it's just priceless. Um, so if somebody has a recessive chin, do we do chin implants at the same time? And do you use cartilage for that? There's, there's two schools of thought with chin implants. Um, they're doing cartilage for chin implants. A is not going to yield in a, a tremendous change, and B, uh, it can shift. The chin is a large structure, so if somebody really needs a chin implant, I will usually use something called a silastic implant, which we place through a little small incision uh, underneath the chin, um, and you don't even know it's there because it incorporates into the bone and it feels like bone. So I found that that's uh, the best solution. But I got to tell you, rarely is the case that I'm putting in a chin implant when I'm doing a rhinoplasty. Most times, if I see an overly projected nose or a very stuck out nose that would initially give me the impression of a recessed chin, I'll, I'll kind of I'll talk patients away from the chin implant and say, listen, we can do a chin implant anytime. Why would I have you spend money or have a surgery done that you might not need? Let's address the nose first. And let's see what that looks like. Um, and then a risk complication of patient with thin skin, which has lost elasticity from aging. I'm assuming that this number here, 64, is your age. Well, that's a young man. And I would not, I would not have any um, issues with skin complications or problems with blood flow to the skin in any way. The nose has a very robust, rich source of blood on, multiple, on not only several deep sources of blood, but also several superficial sources of blood. So that's never been an issue at all. Not, I've never even heard of that being an issue. Uh, so yeah, you should be absolutely fine. Um, how long will I be bruised and swollen? Um, everybody's different. Uh, just this morning, I saw a rhinoplasty from yesterday, had no bruising. Um, so a rhinoplasty that we did on Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, had no bruising. 
So everybody's different. Then I've had rhinoplasties that at a, at a week, they have a little bit of bruising down here. As a rule, most of the bruising is to a point right around here. If the maximum bruising is gonna occur, it's right in here, okay? So um, at a week, it's almost always green or yellow and it's uh, by a week and a half, it's completely gone. But keep in mind, even at a week, you can uh, place some makeup on it and cover it up. We have some pretty good makeup here that'll work, but I'm sure you, you can find foundational stuff most places, uh, you know, uh, ultra or whatever. What is it called? Ultra. Ulta. 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 Sorry. Ultra. That's the fear. All right. You can tell I've never bought makeup. Okay. <laughs> when will I see my new nose? Uh, in a week. Take the splint off in a week. And that's, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had patients in tears in a week because they saw the nose that they never thought that they could have and that they've wanted their whole life. Very emotional for all of us, me uh, in particular. So yeah, usually at a week you see a very good uh, impression of what your nose looks like and uh, you, you're gonna be amazed. I think we got another couple questions. How is sufficient nose cartilage determined? Whew. Boy, that's a good question. It's like- uh, you're, stumped, you're stumping the doctor? No, 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 I'm not being stumped. Uh, it's, okay. When, you, when you're looking at the surgery, the most important part of rhinoplasty is not what you take, it's what you leave behind. Okay, so we have certain uh, guidelines as to how much cartilage we have and or bone we have to leave behind to maintain support of the nose. Because again, Michael Jackson's main issue is all of his cartilage was removed. So there's that extreme. And then the other extreme is you having rhinoplasty and hardly any cartilage is removed. And you say, what the heck did I just pay all this money for? So there's a happy balance between those two. Um, the best way that I can really tell you how much cartilage will be removed in your particular case is for you to come and see me if you find the time and we can go over that in detail. Um, but again, I can only remove cartilage up until structural support is jeopardized. If I get to that point where structural support begins to uh, get jeopardized, I will not go any further. So I'm not gonna subject you to that, you know? Um, okay, I don't know if that answered it. I hope it did. Uh, will insurance cover any part of the surgery if you have a deviated septum and snoring at night? Um, insurance can cover uh, deviated septums. Um, I do not accept insurance assignments of any kind. Uh, if you're, if you're um, interested in uh, insurance assignment, I can refer you to some ENTs that I know in town. Um, but if you're wanting to do the aesthetic part, uh, I always do the septoplasty as it is. So I don't charge more or less for the procedure. I always do the septoplasty because I've, I've never found a case where the septum isn't slightly deviated. So to answer your question, I personally do not accept any insurances. Um, and, if, uh, and if you are strictly an insurance case that you only want to have your septum fixed and you want insurance to cover it, I have some really good guys, that, uh, some really good ENTs uh, that'll help you. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Did I, uh, did I miss anybody? No, I think that's all. Well, okay, so I wanna thank you all very much for uh, asking fantastic questions at the end. Um, it's always good when I have to stop and um, like uh, Amy said, get stumped a little bit, uh, but um, uh, the, this presentation was fun. Uh, so I really do hope that I, uh, I hope, wait, one more. Um, is open approach necessary for reshaping the middle nose? All right, so uh, before I say my final thank yous, let me answer this. There's no such thing, uh, open approach and closed approach. It's the same surgery except for one little incision about that big. I'm able to do everything through closed approach because I know where the cartilages are. I can bring the cartilages out, shape them, and put them back in without having to make any external incisions. Open approach is popular in academic centers and it's popular now amongst the younger surgeons that aren't really being trained in the endonasal surgeries anymore. Um, it's kind of like, use the analogy, of an automatic car and a manual car will get you to the same place, but nowadays no young kid knows how to drive a manual car, right? Um, us older guys know how to drive the manual car. It's a little bit more challenging, um, and, uh, but it, uh, my approach is I prefer to not use an incision or place an incision unless I have to. 
So that's something I can certainly talk to you about. Cases where I do an open approach, if I um, end up having to do it is usually, uh, if it's a tough revision surgery, somebody's had multiple procedures in the past and I'm now doing a revision upon a revision, there's a lot of scarring. Uh, second is if the nose is pretty, uh, if it's really crooked. Um, and then the, of course the last case, if it's pretty traumatic, so there's a lot of breaks and whatnot, um, then I'll probably prepare the patient uh, for a higher likelihood of uh, opening the nose, so to speak. Either way, the recovery is probably delayed only by a week or so in terms of swelling of the tip of the nose. The scar ends up looking fine. It just takes a lot longer for that scar to heal. And I just, I'm always of the opinion that if I can avoid placing a scar anywhere on the face that's visible, I'll do that at all costs. Um, uh, but yeah. Okay, so good questions. Um, I think that's all. I want to thank all of you for for listening and I hope you all have a fantastic uh, uh, Independence Day weekend coming up. And uh, okay, thanks again, bye-bye.